Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. Welcome to Vita Church on Facebook Live or YouTube. Thank you so much for joining us here today at Venture. And would you please invite your friends right now at this moment by clicking on the share button on your phone or on Facebook, on your computer. Come on, let's all stand and worship Jesus right now. We're going to sing hallelujah. We're going to praise his name this morning because he is alive. Amen. Sing it out. Come on.
sing it one more time at home. Let's sing it again. Because he lives, see, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone.
Good morning, Venture Church, and happy Easter. You know, for years and years, I've opened each Easter service by saying, he is risen, and then the congregation would respond, he is risen indeed. And uh, though we may not be in person this morning, we're going to do that anyhow, and I'm just going to trust that you will, you will say it back in your homes all across this land. So, good morning, church. He is risen. Amen. I wish you all a happy Easter, and thank you for joining us on this special occasion. Uh, we're living in truly historic times. I believe in years and decades to come, we're going to look back at 2020, the year of the coronavirus pandemic, and we're going to marvel at how the world has changed because of this one event. And when I think of the history of this great globe that we call Earth, there have been numerous life-altering events that have occurred, things that have created significant change, some for the better, some for the worst. There have been wars and pandemics. There have been outbreaks. There have been terrorist attacks uh, on the negative side. But there have been advancements in transportation and communication. There have been breakthroughs in, in medicine and in science. A lot of amazing things have happened. But probably the biggest, most life-altering event, in fact, it was actually the biggest pandemic that has ever hit this earth occurred in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve took a bite of the forbidden fruit. And since that fateful day, every person has been born with a disease, been born with a condition that we call sin. I was born with it. You were born with it. Your sweet old grandmother was born with it. This, this sin, this virus, is the ultimate cause of death for every person. Only one person has ever been born uninfected with this disease, and his name was Jesus Christ. And in an ultimate act of love, while in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus took the cup of sin, he took the virus, he took that, that cup, and he drank it. He took the disease in order to become the cure. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 42, my father... Jesus speaking in the garden. He's praying, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And that, my friends, is indeed what Jesus Christ did. He took upon himself all of, uh, all of the sin of the world, everything that you and I have done, and he bore it on Calvary's cross. But thankfully, the story doesn't end there because after three days, Jesus Christ rose from the dead, proving that he was God. Death, where is thy victory? Grave, where is thy sting? Christ defeated death. He defeated sin. He defeated the grave. And we no longer need to fear the disease of sin because Jesus has provided the cure. And I don't believe there's ever been a bigger event to ever occur on this planet than the resurrection of Jesus Christ when he declared victory over sin and disease and death and the grave. The crucifixion, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the turning point of the world. It changed everything. Jesus became the cure to our true problem. You know, for the last four weeks, we've been talking about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And if you've missed any of those messages, I encourage you to go to our website and, and catch up on some of those. The early followers of Jesus Christ were ordinary people. They were people who probably found Jesus to be interesting, uh, engaging. They enjoyed listening to him teach. He was an excellent communicator, used a lot of word pictures, told a lot of stories. Perhaps they found him enlightening. They found him to be someone who really gave them some good wisdom. But I don't think they really understood, those early followers of Christ, that he was Christ, that he was the Messiah, that he was the anointed one, the chosen one. He was the Savior of the world. I don't think they really understood that until after the resurrection. They had seen him do miracles. They'd listened to his teaching. They'd been watching his move. They'd seen all of the amazing things that he had done. They even witnessed his crucifixion. But then he rose again. He rose again and he proved that he was indeed God. Jesus had many different types of followers. He had general followers, people that just wanted to see what he was doing. Uh, these were people that kind of watched Jesus from a distance. And then there were curious onlookers who had heard about him that uh, kind of wondered about him. And so they kind of would come to see what this Jesus thing was all about. 
wanted to see what he was going to do next. Then there were the faithful followers, and this were kind of the group. He said he was the one that, that just went with him kind of wherever he went, and they weren't necessarily part of the inner circle, but they were, they, were, they were just there. They just kept watching from a distance to see what he was going to do next. And then there was his inner circle. Then there was his, his small group, his, his 12 apostles. They were his team. They were his group. And Jesus spent a significant amount of time teaching them and, and coaching them and, and really leading them and just kind of being with them. So today we're going to continue our story uh, of what it means to be a follower of Christ by looking at Mark chapter number 10. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to pull them out and turn to the book of Mark chapter number 10. Now, Mark was not one of Jesus' apostles. Mark was actually someone who spent a significant amount of time with Peter. And so really what we have here is probably Mark's version of what he had heard Peter uh, say. And so today we're going to look at a conversation between Jesus and his disciples where they were stopped on the way to Jerusalem. And uh, he said, if you're going to be in a position where you're going to be leading this movement in the future, in, in other words, Jesus is, I'm sure, thinking that if, if I'm going to be handing the reins uh, of this whole operation over to this group, there's some things that they need to know. So he sat down on the way into Jerusalem for the last time, and we pick it up in Mark 10:32. They were on the way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the 12 aside and told them this is what was going to happen to him. Really what he's doing here is they're on the way to Jerusalem, and he says, guys, you need to know something. This isn't going to be like other trips we've taken to Jerusalem. We're not gonna be celebrated uh, the way you think we are. Things are about to get rough. We're gonna go through some really difficult times. We've had some great times. We've seen some am amazing things. The crowds have loved us, but things are about to change. You're gonna discover when we get to Jerusalem that uh, uh, people aren't gonna receive us the way you think they will. We're going to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. Look at this, verse 33. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Now, the son of man here, Jesus is talking about himself, Jesus, and he said that they were going to be handing him over to the Gentiles. That's the Romans. In verse 33, they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And my friends, that's exactly what they did. They brutally tortured Jesus Christ. On Friday, we celebrated Good Friday, the day where we recognize and remember what Jesus Christ did as he was crucified for our sins. And so Jesus here is warning them that, listen, things, things are gonna get really bad. But then he, he gave them the good news. Uh, he said in verse 34, three days later, he will rise. Now, I'm sure... I'm not sure that the disciples really understood what Jesus meant by this. They were probably still trying to get their head wrapped around the whole spitting and flogging stuff and just trying to get their, like, what are you talking about? But I don't think they really understood the fact that, that Jesus just told them that he was going to die and that he was going to raise again after three days. Because I think had they really understood that, they would have been waiting at the grave that day. They would have never left that grave. They would have been there waiting to see Jesus when he rose from the dead, but they weren't. They had scattered. So here Jesus tells them in this very intense moment, uh, he, he, he talks to his closest friends and he says, listen, I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be spit on. I'm going to be flogged. I'm going to be killed. I've got to imagine that had to be a pretty emotional conversation, wouldn't you think? I mean, it'd be pretty shocking. I mean, I would think that if I was telling some of my closest friends that that was going to happen to me, that their response would be, I am so sorry. How can I help? What, what can I do? Is there any way that we can get out of this? Do you have to do this? Can we go somewhere else? I mean, is this absolutely necessary? Verse 35, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we asked. Hey, Jesus, hey, you know, I'm really kind of sorry about the whole spitting and flogging and dying thing here, but hey, is there any chance you could do us a favor? That's really what they're saying here. And I think Jesus' response is very kind given everything he's just shared with them. He says, what do you want me to do for you? Verse 36. 
In verse 37, they replied, let one of us sit on your right and the other at your left in your glory. Are you kidding me here? I've just told you all this is gonna happen and you're asking me if you can sit on my right and my left? You know, it'd be kind of like if you sit down with your kids and you have to share some horribly bad news with them. I've developed a disease and I'm going to be dead within a week, you tell your kids. And their response is, so does that mean that you're gonna not need your car anymore? Because I'd really like to have your car. You see, that's the same kind of response here that Jesus got. He just told them everything that was gonna happen to him and they're asking, hey, can I sit on your right? Can I sit on your left? I think they were pretty much clueless. They just didn't get it. And that's kind of what Jesus said in verse 38. You don't know, you don't know what you're asking. Jesus said, can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? We can, they answered Jesus. He said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. And of course, the other 10 disciples who weren't there when James and John kind of pulled Jesus aside and asked for this little favor, when they heard about this, they became indignant, it says, in verse 41, when the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Now, you would think that they became indignant because how insensitive could you be? How could you do that to Jesus? But that wasn't why they were indignant. They were indignant because they wanted to be the ones that sat on the right and the ones that sat on the left. Verse 42, Jesus called them together. And he said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. So Jesus, let me just pause here. Jesus is about to give them a little leadership lesson here. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually kind of give this to you so you understand it in a kind of a contemporary way. What Jesus is saying is he's saying, you know how when you're the president of the company, everybody answers to you? You know how like when you're the boss, everyone has to listen and do what you tell them to do? I mean, everybody wants to be at the top of the pecking order. Nobody wants to be the one being told what to do. Do you understand what I'm saying there, disciples? And they were like, yeah, yeah. Verse 43, Jesus said, not so with you. Not so with you. You see, that's not the way it's gonna work in my kingdom. My kingdom is not about top-down autocratic uh, uh, leadership. That's not the way it works. He said, if you're going to be my follower, if you're gonna be an influencer in my kingdom, if you're gonna be a leader in my world, Jesus said this. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first, be the boss, be the president, must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This is, this is a huge shift. This is a major point that Jesus is making here. If you're a note taker this morning, I encourage you to write this down. The way to lead in my kingdom is by serving others. That's what Jesus is saying. It's not about commanding those under your authority. It's about serving. It's not about who gets to sit in the right and the left. It's who can we serve? You see, because to lead in Jesus' kingdom, it's not about ability. It's about humility. And we have it all messed up. We honor those who have special ability and those who have talents. And Jesus says, what I'm looking for is people who are humble. I'm looking for people who don't make much of themselves, but instead make much of Jesus by serving and reaching out and loving them. You see, that's, that's the way God's kingdom works. And it's the way that we're to continue to live today. He said, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God is looking for people of humility who are willing to serve him. You see, the key to greatness in the kingdom of God is to serve others out of a heart of humility. That's what it's all about. If you wanna be great, it's not about how high and how much you can accomplish and how much you can, how much you can collect and get and have. Instead, it's about serving others in humility. 
So while the disciples are here trying to jockey into a leadership position, while they're trying to cozy up to Jesus so they can get a good seat at the table, James and John here, they're schmoozing Jesus, but he didn't bite. Because you see, that's not the way it works in the kingdom of God. That's the same way it is today, my friends. You and I are called to be servants. You and I are called to reach out to the, the lowest and the least and the lost. It's not about climbing the ladder of success. It's about kneeling down in humility to help the down and out. I've said this before, but we are at a pivotal moment in history where we as the church can be the hands and feet of Jesus. Now we may or may not be flattening the curve in this virus, but I can tell you this, we are flattening the economy. In the coming months, unemployment is going to be unleashed in this community and around the world, and it's gonna create terrible pain. And I believe that this is going to give us, followers of Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, the opportunity to be servants of Christ. We must be ready to help. We must be ready to reach out a hand and help a brother or sister up. We must be ready with a word of encouragement. You see, this, this virus didn't just capsize, capsize a few boats in the harbor. We are all swimming. We are all in this together, and we need each other at this time. You see, today we're all missionaries, and you are on the front lines of ministry today. Rich or poor, young or old, we are in this together, and I believe we will get through this together. I think the key is for all of us to have a servant's heart. So I think this time poses the greatest crisis that many of have ever faced. Many of us have never seen anything like this. And I believe that this is a moment in history where the church can stand up and be the church, share the love of Christ. You know, for years, we've been sitting in pews, sitting in rows, sitting in classrooms, reading our Bible, reading Bible study books, reading Christian help books. We've been learning about Jesus, but now it's time for us to put our faith in action. It's time for us to live out our faith. Today, we are all missionaries of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I think back to Acts chapter one, verse eight, where Jesus said, you're gonna be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And he told the church at that day, he said, I want you to go out, but they didn't do it. They stayed in Jerusalem, they stayed there. So in Acts chapter eight, verse one, we saw persecution come into the church and the church was driven out of Jerusalem. And then as a result of the persecution and being driven out of the city, that is when the church growth movement was sparked. And that is when the gospel went around the world. And you know, this may be that moment when the church is pushed out of the building and into the community. This may be that Acts chapter eight, verse one moment for this generation, the time that the church is pushed out of the building, out into the place where the people are so we can love them and serve them and meet their needs. So church, you're missionaries today. Every one of you listening to this message is a follower of Jesus Christ. You're a missionary today to your home, to your neighborhood, to your neighbors, to those who are around you. So here's the question. Here's the question I want you to ask today. It's a simple forward question. How can I help? How can I help? At this time is the time for every one of us listening to this message to say, how can I help? What can I do at this moment to be the church, to share the gospel, to be the hands and feet of Jesus? Maybe you can pick up the phone and call somebody. Maybe you can be a digital ambassador and get on social media and all the different platforms and point people to Christ and invite people to hear about Jesus. There may be some people that you could lend a hand, maybe go buy groceries for them or go get some things they need. Some of you may have the ability to help pay a bill for somebody that, that can't pay a bill, but you could help. One of the things that we're doing as a church is we're giving gift cards to 
those who are in need, almost a quarter of the population, uh, well, I don't, know if, I don't know if it's a quarter, but a significant portion of the population is going to be unemployed in the near future. And there's gonna be a lot of people who are struggling with cash flow, a lot of people who are gonna be in need. And this is an opportunity for us to give a gift card, just a token to let them know that we love them. Now, church, I've got to say, you have responded so well. We have received thousands of dollars worth of gift cards, thousands of dollars worth of gift cards. But you see, it isn't about me collecting the gift cards and me handing them all out. We've got the gift cards and I want you to give them out. Give them out to the people that you know that are in need. Church, this is the time that I want you to be the one that's reaching out and handing out those things and sharing the love of Jesus Christ. How do you do it? Very simple. If you know somebody who's in need, somebody that, that could really use a, a, an encouragement, that could use a little help with the groceries or whatever they may need, just send an email to help at venturenaples.com, help at venturenaples.com, and say, I've got a friend or I've got a neighbor, or I've got a coworker that could really use a card. I will send that card to you and you can then distribute it to your friends, family, neighbors, people. I mean, it would be easy to just go to a poor community and walk around and hand out all the cards. We could, be, we could hand out thousands of dollars worth of cards in, in an afternoon. That's not the plan. The plan is to put them in your hands for you to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this community at this time. Just days before Jesus was crucified, he sat down with his followers and he gave them a little lesson on what it meant to be great in his kingdom. And he said, it all starts with humility. It all starts with being a servant. And at this crazy time in history, I believe the message for us today is, church, let's do it. Let's be the hands and feet of Jesus. Let's serve our community. Let's serve those in need at this time. Let's bring light in the midst of darkness. Let's bring hope into this situation because God is still on the throne and he's still saving people today. My friends, if you're listening today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your savior, you've never prayed and asked him for the forgiveness of sin and for the free gift of salvation, I encourage you to do it. You see, trusting Christ as your savior it's a gift. It's a gift that's offered to everyone who's willing to receive it. Whosoever will may come, the Bible says. You see, I can't, I can't, I can't heal myself from the sin disease that I have. Jesus Christ is the cure. He is the one who paid the price on Calvary's cross so that I could be saved, so that you could be saved. But it is a gift that is offered, but it's not forced upon you. It's not a reward that is earned. It's a gift that's to be received. And if you have never received that gift of salvation, it is so easy. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's something where you just simply ask for it. Say, Jesus, would you forgive me of my sins? I can't do it on my own. I can't do enough good works to earn it. But I can believe by faith that you died on Calvary's cross, were buried, and rose again. And I put my faith in what you did. I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the best I know how, I'm asking you to forgive me and save me. If you have never prayed that prayer, I encourage you today, ask God to save you. Before you put your head on your pillow tonight, ask Jesus to save you. Just before I pray for us here today, I want to say I'm going to wrap up this series on what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ next week. And have you ever wondered how it was possible that one of the 12 apostles, Judas, have you ever wondered how someone who'd seen the miracles, who'd listened to Jesus, who had firsthand interaction with Jesus, could spend three years with him and then, and then yet abandon him, walk away? unfollow Jesus. Next week, I'm going to talk about how it is that Judas unfollows Jesus. So you're not going to want to miss that. I encourage you to tune in. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus Christ and for all that he's done for us. Father, we don't deserve salvation. We don't deserve your grace and your mercy and your love. We don't deserve it. 
the fact that Jesus was willing to take upon himself our sin, my sin, the sin of each person who's listening here this morning, that he was willing to drink that cup and ingest and become our sin so that we might inherit his righteousness, so that we might receive his forgiveness. God, it's just, it's amazing to us. But God, we thank you. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for each person who's listening this morning. If there's anyone today who's listening to this message who doesn't know Christ as their Savior, God, even right now, may they cry out to him in faith and say, God, please forgive me and cleanse me. I believe that Jesus died for me, was buried, and rose again. And the best I know how, I'm asking you to save me. Oh, God. That is our prayer. And then, Lord, help us as the church as we are now scattered out of our buildings and out into the world. May, God, we serve our community, our friends, and our neighbors with an attitude of humility and be the hands and feet of Jesus at this time. Father, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful
Sunday, everybody.